COVID-19 cases and variants are bad in BC right now, but they could get a lot worse. It's about finding those ways to do it more safely. There's no zero risk right now. It's a, it's, we're seeing this virus being transmitted in lots of places. Um, but we know that the, the order is about indoor gatherings because those are the riskiest settings. This guy's literally been following me in circles yes, for like 40 minutes and I've been recording it. We were very pleased that we were able to um, arrest uh, the right person in this case. It was a terrifying incident that was caught on camera. A Vancouver woman followed by a stranger through the streets of the city. Charges have now been laid in the case and tonight we hear from the woman in the video who says she's tentatively relieved. Maybe just some some gray area to work with uh, to work with us. So you're a food delivery driver working, say, for Skip the Dishes or Uber Eats. You finally managed to find some parking. It wasn't free. The question is, do you hurry up and run in and pick up the order for delivery, or do you pay, which takes about as long as going in and just picking it up? And then if you do go in and you didn't pay, what if you're delayed? Well, it's a conundrum one local union says needs to be addressed, especially as the pandemic continues. There are 1,205 new cases of COVID-19 in BC tonight, and three more people have died in the last day. For the second day in a row, there's a record number of people in hospital. 409 patients are receiving care, and 125 people are in the ICU. Right now, we have a lot of transmission in communities across the province. So what does that mean? Even if we can see people outside our household, we shouldn't right now. And if we do, it needs to be the same small group of people. As of tomorrow, anyone 45 and older in BC, born in 1976 or earlier, can register online to order to book their vaccination appointment. And anyone 40 and older, born in 1981 or earlier, can sign up on Monday. You can register online at gov.bc.ca slash get vaccinated. BC's hospitalizations, isolations, and daily cases are as high as they've ever been. And the latest modeling from the province shows that if we don't all commit to restrictions, it could get a lot worse. Like tripling new daily cases by next week. See the red line? That's if we don't change. The blue line is where we need to be at 40% of pre-COVID activities. Top Dr. Bonnie Henry says the worst case is avoidable. Models are, uh, give us a sense of what are the parameters that are most important going forward. It's not a prediction. It's not a prediction that we're going to have 3,000 cases next week. And we've not seen that happen in other models that have presented in the past. It helps us look at what are the things that we need to adjust and where we need to go with those. So, um, it, it, you know, we are, uh, we've put in additional restrictions. Um, people are paying attention. She's not adding more restrictions, but reminding people to stick to 10 maximum, the same 10, and wear masks if close together, even if outside. It's about finding those ways to do it more safely. There's no zero risk right now. It's a, it's, we're seeing this virus being transmitted in lots of places, um, but we know that the, the order is about indoor gatherings because those are the riskiest settings. Schools have had the spotlight of concern for many, the latest numbers showing worst fears not playing out. We've not seen increased transmission in the school environment. Again, uh, you know, it talks to um, the importance of uh, safety measures and structured environments being less risky than some of the unstructured social connections that we have. Though most in-school transmissions have been kids catching the virus, studies showing there have been relatively few. 55 in Vancouver Coastal Health before Christmas, then in Fraser Health, Christmas to spring break, 267 in just 15 percent of their schools. This is the data many have been waiting for. Families are saying that they don't have enough information about what's happening in the schools to make uh, informed decisions about their children's safety. And so, you know, this provides some information in, I would say, only in Fraser Health, the Fraser Health Authority, really. Um, and so, you know, my hope is that we're going to get more timely data because I'm not sure this is going to put people at ease, and it should. But with variants in the majority now, 60% and growing, half of those the more transmissible P1 variant, mooring echoing what Dr. Henry says, there's no room for error. 
when the variants in particular get a foothold in some of these communities, they spread rapidly because people just aren't thinking there is at risk as, as Vancouver, where you see people, you know, in the streets where you're wearing masks all the time. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yuzda. Another big delivery delay from Moderna. We're fully aware the provinces are making adjustments. Why are shipments of precious doses being pushed back? And when can we expect them? Thanks to JT Miller, the Vancouver Canucks are going to get at least a little more time to recover from their COVID outbreak. Of course, Miller so candid on Wednesday with his comments, saying it didn't feel safe for the Canucks to return so soon to action after what the players had gone through. And now the league has postponed Friday's game against the Oilers. And there is word and rumors that Saturday's game against the Leafs will be postponed as well. So the Canucks may not be returning to action until Sunday versus the Maple Leafs. I spoke to one player today before Friday's game was postponed. And he said a game on Friday night was out of the question for him and a number of his teammates as they're trying to get back into shape. He also said that one extra day would be big and two extra days would be absolutely huge. Now, three Canucks remain on the COVID list, but I can tell you this. They had a fairly big practice on Thursday, but there are some players that are already off the list that still cannot practice with the team. So that tells you what these guys are going through and they're still suffering through some symptoms so it's going to be very interesting to see what the Canucks lineup look like looks like in fact what the Canucks coaching staff will look like when ultimately they do return to play hey do you mind if I guys if I sit with you guys this guy's literally been following me in circles we were very pleased that we were able to um, arrest uh, the right person in this case I want nothing more than this to be the man I just want more than I want more than just a word. A man has been arrested and charged after a woman reported being followed by a stranger in Vancouver for 40 minutes last month. But the woman who recorded the video and posted it to social media says she's heard very little from police as to how they know they have the right guy. Literally just standing behind me and I don't know what's issue. Yeah, cool. just pull off Last month, Vancouver resident Jamie Coots shared a video of a man following her on March 17th for 40 minutes through the streets of Vancouver's Tinseltown neighborhood. She finally found a group of people at a local skate park and asked if she could sit down with them. About 15 minutes later, she called police. Coots says she was surprised to hear about the arrest and charges Thursday and says she's heard very little from police as to how they identified the man. They literally didn't mean zero details. Um, they don't want to compromise the investigation, which is fair. But I feel like for my own comfort, I need some type of just some type of confirmation, you know, other than them just saying they're doing their job. A lot of things up in the air. I'm sure they're under a lot of pressure right now for answers that I'm sh sure they're not ready to give at this moment. So unfortunately, all the questions that I have, I don't really or maybe I'm just not entitled to answers at this moment. I'm not sure. Mohammed Majipur, a 33-year-old resident of no fixed address, is now charged with one count of criminal harassment in relation to that incident. As a result of the investigation, our detectives were able to do uh, more investigating and have also um, set forth uh, several other charges to Crown Council, which now have been approved. The 33-year-old has been charged in five other incidents, all from around the same time, including mischief, assault with a weapon, and another case of criminal harassment. After she posted the video on social media, Coots says she was inundated with messages from other women, saying they've had similar interactions with a similar man. Based on, yeah, people calling police um, and our investigators investigating, speaking with witnesses, reviewing video footage, we were able to um, uh, hold this person of interest uh, accountable. In an email to Coots after she requested more information about how police identified the man, she says an officer replied, I'm sure that you can appreciate that we cannot go into specifics about the investigative techniques used to identify Mr. Majid Poor, but please rest assured that we are extremely confident about this, as is Crown Council. Until we get a little bit more uh, concrete information. I'm just going to keep waiting, I guess. Police say Majidpur remains in custody. In Vancouver, Ashley Burr, City News. I thought the Vancouver Games in 2010 were going to be the only Olympics this city would see. Could the Winter Games come back to Vancouver and BC in 2030? Just ahead, we take a look at the Olympic pitch headed to the Vancouver Board of Trade this Friday. 
these these workers that were once almost like it's a, a treat to order in food have really turned into essential frontline workers. We're simply asking to be treated like a normal delivery driver. App-based delivery drivers should have access to free short-term parking. That from the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. The local chapter New Westminster has written a letter to a number of BC mayors asking municipalities like Victoria, Vancouver, New Westminster and Burnaby to look at the issue. They say as the pandemic has created explosive demand for food delivery, a problem has cropped up. Workers are either walking a very long distance for free parking or ending up with expensive tickets over very short stops. The workers themselves can, can tell you almost nightly experiences of that. Um, and you know, one of the big examples is where you run in for a minute thinking you're just running in to pick up the food. Um, and for whatever reason, there's a delay and your minute turns into 10 minutes. Um, and that's where you actually, that's where you often see the parking ticket. Um, and you know, uh, the price of a parking ticket can really negate a, a whole evening of work um, for some of these workers. And the amount of time that it takes me to run, you know, to run to the meter, take my phone out, go to pay by phone, do all the information. It actually takes me less time to run in to grab an order. Andrew Seacard is a local actor. You'll see him in a number of indie movies, commercials and the Hallmark Channel. You also might catch him making a delivery for DoorDash, a gig he says fits with his unpredictable schedule, but agrees not having any official place for pickups has been frustrating. It looks like you have a couple of tickets here. I do, yes. Yeah, I have two tickets. I got them one in December and then one just recently in March, uh, March the 7th. Off the top of your head, do you remember some of the circumstances uh, around these tickets? I do, actually, yeah. So in both instances, I came out while my car was being looked at. The ticket had not been issued yet. Uh, and then I came out, explained the situation. They didn't care. I was handed the parking ticket regardless. So, yeah. Maybe just some some gray area to work with to work with us, especially in times like this. Now, the union behind the push says most workers they've spoken with agree a parking pass or decal would be ideal or a loading zone. The city of Vancouver says the letter from UFCW will be reviewed and that at first glance, there may be opportunities to integrate parking payment into the app or share information about whether a vehicle is actively working to determine if it's eligible for parking privileges. But the city warns it's hard to distinguish app delivery drivers from other private vehicles and that the services being offered evolve rapidly. Our hope and certainly our ask of municipalities is that it, it can happen um, immediately because uh, the, the problem is right now. In Vancouver, David Zura, City News. A 38-year-old man is recovering after being shot at a motel in Surrey last night. It happened at the Gross Motel on King George Boulevard. Police believe the victim was targeted and don't believe there's any risk to the public. <laughs> Just over a decade ago, the Olympic Cauldron was lit in Vancouver to start the 2010 Winter Games. Now, this Friday, one of the people who led the successful bid will make the pitch for the region to host the 2030 Winter Games. We asked some people in Vancouver's Olympic Village for their opinion. Yes, yes, 100% yes. Uh, no, I don't think so. Or some other city in Canada should host before Vancouver again. I think it's a good thing. John Furlong helped lead the bid for the 2010 Games. Oh, when you look at the venues we have, they're world class. And he will deliver a plan to the Vancouver Board of Trade on Friday. And it encompasses more of BC than the Lower Mainland and Whistler. Sportsnet 650's Craig McEwen covered the Games in 2010. I covered this story from the get-go, right when they were in Salt Lake pitching the idea to when they got the announcement in Prague that they'd won it. One thing about John, he's an incredible story tell her he's captivating so he's obviously going to grab their attention furlong says the cost of bidding for 2030 would be a fraction of the 36 million dollars spent on the 2010 and that the games would cost less because venues are still in place he says this would also free up resources for other regions of the province to participate they have a blueprint and know exactly what it takes to do it so there's no surprises you know security costs would obviously be a lot more expensive i'm guessing but bottom line that knowing of how to put something on like that the ability to kind of flip over some venues that you could use again that would give vancouver a real easy entry point into the olympics with fewer cities interested in bidding for and hosting the olympic games the international olympic committee has tried to make it easier with their agenda 2020 program that basically says reuse and recycle beijing won a two-horse race for the 2022 winter olympics just 14 years after hosting the summer games but bottom line i guess it's going to come down to the fact of whether there's an appetite by the city that they want to go through this again and you know put 
quite a bit of money into something that I see the benefit in, but as you mentioned before, there are other things in this province and city that need to be adjusted and dealt with as well. In Vancouver, Kier Junos, City News. The Vancouver Aquarium has been sold to an American company. Hershand Enterprises is a privately owned tourism company. The aquarium had suffered massive revenue losses because of the COVID pandemic. Ownership now transfers from Oceanwise Conservation Association to the U.S. company. The operation had been facing the threat of permanent closure. In a statement, the facility says this is a very positive outcome that secures both the future of the Vancouver Aquarium and the Marine Mammal Rescue Centre. Moderna doses destined for Canada are facing another delay as next week's scheduled delivery of 1.2 million shots is pushed back to month's end. We're fully aware the provinces are making adjustments and we're trying to narrow this down as much as possible so that they don't find themselves in a situation where they have to constantly react uh, to perceived delays. A Moderna shipment that was supposed to arrive last week has only started to show up over the last several days, forcing some clinics in the country's hottest hotspots to cancel thousands of appointments. It clearly impacts because the quicker we have vaccines, the quicker we can uh, provide those vaccines to others. When you have a change in schedule of delivery, it means a change in everything else that we're doing. It might have been... Um, uh, challenging for provinces as they had to uh, rejig their schedule. The head of Canada's COVID-19 vaccine distribution says the problem comes down to a so-called quality assurance backlog. It's not a production problem. It's part of the entire process of getting vaccines out the door to, uh, to countries. While the drug maker has been delivering vaccines on a three-week basis, it recently moved to a bi-weekly schedule. This is a company that is continuing to ramp up production and they are experiencing some bump along the way. But Pfizer vaccines continue to arrive like clockwork, blunting the impact of Moderna delays on Canada's vaccination campaign. The majority of our vaccines coming into the country right now are from Pfizer. 12.7 million doses have been delivered to the provinces and territories to date, with more than 8.8 .8 million administered. But health experts insist the third wave of the pandemic could not have been stopped by rolling out vaccines faster. The vaccines are, are one tool in our toolbox and a very important tool, but it's not the vaccines alone that are going to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, solve it all. Karen Siolin, City News. The first 5G drone flight in our country was carried out last week at UBC, demonstrating the potential of that technology. It was done as a part of a partnership between Indro Robotics and Rogers, the parent company of the station. Normally, drones communicate using radio frequencies, but the companies involved say 5G enhances their capabilities. The companies say 5G drones can be used in a number of industries, including agriculture, natural resources and construction.